Alex for coming to this lecture and thank you to our remote viewers, our remote audience. Uh, if you'd like to tweet in questions during the question answer session, you can do that at Palestine Center. Today's lecture is entitled Prolonged Israeli Occupation and Palestinian Child Prisoners. Our guests today are from Defense for uh, Children International uh, Palestine and they are Brad Parker who's the staff attorney uh, an international advocacy officer, and Ivan Karakashian, advocacy unit coordinator. Uh, Mr. Rifat Kassis was not able to make it today for reasons which Brad Parker will explain to you in a few minutes. So this lecture today, um, in this presentation, they will discuss how Palestinian children are violently affected by Israel's military occupation in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza. The presentation will focus on the systematic and uh, ill treatment and torture of Palestinian children in Israeli military detention, 75% of whom experience uh, some form of violence. This presentation will also highlight the dual legal systems operating in the occupied Palestinian territory and the disparity between legal protections provided to Palestinian children and Israeli children. So please welcome Mr. Brad Parker. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, it's nice to be here, and we're happy that you all came out to, to listen to what we have to say. Um, I do apologize that Rafat Kassis wasn't able to be here speaking. Um, he had some issues uh, with his travel documents at the Amman airport and wasn't able to get on his flight. So he'll meet up with us when we make it to Chicago this weekend. Um, but unfortunately, he's not, he's not here for you all to uh, listen to him. Hopefully, in the next 40 minutes, I can cover uh, everything that Samira says I will. Um, we, I'm Brad Parker. I work for Defense for Children International Palestine. We're a local Palestinian human rights organization. We're the only Palestinian organization that works specifically on child rights. We are affiliated with the international movement, Defense for Children International, but we are autonomous and raise our own funding, set our own priorities, set our own programming for the specific context that, that children face within the East Jerusalem, West Bank, and Gaza. Um, so we have offices, our main office is in Ramallah, we have an office in Hebron, and we have an office in, in Nablus, where we have uh, attorneys, social workers, and field re researchers working out of um, both monitoring and documenting human rights, providing legal aid to kids, charged in the Israeli military courts, but also in the, the Palestinian Authority courts. We work with the Palestinian Authority to um, increase protections for kids within the juvenile justice system. So we have trainings, capacity building with, with police, judges, defense attorneys, prosecutors, probation officers, anyone who comes into kit to contact with kids that are in conflict with the law um, or charged in the Palestinian Authority system. We also, we also cover those issues. Um, we have a field field, wor field workers that work out of Gaza, so we also cover uh, issues particular to the context in Gaza related to the blockade, um, whether it's violence, uh, right to education, uh, right to health, all kinds of different issues. Yvonne and I work in the advocacy unit, uh, so we work closely with the legal aid unit and the, the monitoring and documentation unit. Monitor and documentation unit is exactly what you would expect. Uh, we monitor and document human rights violations all through East Jerusalem, West Bank, and Gaza. Anything related to children's rights, um, anything related to violence against children, uh, whether it be settler violence, soldier violence, uh, violence related to milita military offensives, we document those cases um, and try to use different UN mechanisms, different advocacy tools to uh, reach the international community in an effort to put pressure on the Israeli authority to change policies that affect children. Um, through the occupation. So we have, we have some more information about Defense for Children International Palestine. Um, you're free to take it up. I won't talk much more about our organization. I'd like to spend you know, the 40 minutes that we have talking about the issues that we work on uh, and the situation for, for Palestinian kids living in the occupied Palestinian territory. Uh, I'll, I'll focus a bit on or mainly on the Israeli military detention system and, and the experience that kids have within that system. Talk about the systematic ill treatment that we've been documenting for about 10, 12 years now, 
where we can say, based on our documentation, that the ill treatment the kids face during the arrest, transfer, and interrogation phases, phases of the, um, the arrest process, at least within the West Bank, is, is systematic and widespread. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that. So first, we're a child rights organization. Right, our principle as a child rights organization is, you know, our guiding standard is best interests of the child. That's that's what informs and and, and underrides everything that we do. Um, generally, in a juvenile justice system, <laughs> detention is always a last resort. Right, detention, pretrial detention, even uh, detention as part of a sentence, custodial sentences. That's that's never in the best interest of the child, and in, in most cases. Um, so what you have with the Israeli military court system, which has been established since 1967 when Israel occupied the West Bank, including East Jerusalem um, and then and Gaza, they instituted military law. Right? So there's a military commander who has executive, judicial, and legal or legislative authority over the occupied territory. And currently there's about 1,725 to 50 military orders that exist, and military orders are the law uh, that applies to the occupied territory. So military law created the system of military courts where Palestinians, whether you're a man, woman, or child, are automatically prosecuted in those courts um, for violations of the military law, which applies to them. If you're an Israeli citizen living in the West Bank, so if you're an Israeli settler, the, even though the military law technically uh, applies to everybody located in the territory, Israeli civilian law is, is applied to you, um, even though you're in the occupied territory. I'll talk a little bit more specifically around detention and detention of kids on some of the differences between uh, protections for Israeli kids um, versus protections for Palestinian kids within the Israeli military justice system. A couple important points about the military law. So kids can be arrested without warrants. So soldiers have the authority to arrest anyone they suspect of violating uh, the security provisions, the order regarding security provisions. So there's no judicial oversight over arrests. Um, there's no real investigation process prior to an arrest. Most, m most of the evidence gathered um, for an arrest comes after the arrest through, uh, at least with children, coercive interrogations where kids don't have access to counsel, um, and they're denied really basic and fundamental fair trial guarantees and protections. Um, I'll just talk a briefly about the different uh, offenses included in military law, because it gives a sense of how military law is used as part of an occupation um, in an effort to control the population. So you have Military Order 1651 is the, the, the main military order that includes most of your criminal law provisions. Um, you know, a lot of them are similar to a domestic criminal code that we would have here in the U.S. that you would have in any other country in any other legal system. You have homicide, you have manslaughter, you have assault, you have offenses for damage to property, um, but you also have more occupation-related offenses. Right? You have, uh, there's a specific charge for throwing stones. Um, right, not assault with an object, not uh, a battery with an object. It's the specific charge, throwing stones. If you throw stones at the, a military installation, say, so a stationary object or a building, uh, maybe the, the separation wall, that's, that is a potential 10-year maximum sentence under military law. If you throw a stone at a moving object or into traffic, if you throw stones at a car, that's a potential 20-year maximum sentence under military law. So the sentences um, give you a sense of the, the degree to which military law, I think, at least inherently exists to legitimize the, the control aspects of an occupation. The, there's other charges, um, you know, aside from the general, generally applicable criminal charges, right? You have specific charges that, that deal with conduct towards soldiers. So you have a specific charge that's uh, threatening a soldier come with a potential seven to 10 year maximum sentence. Um, threatening a soldier can come with a three year maximum sentence. But you also have a lesser charge that's insulting a soldier or doing something to harm the honor of a soldier, which 
comes with a potential one-year maximum sentence. And it's, uh, I mean, if anybody's an attorney, but if anybody's just <laughs> can think about things uh, objectively and try to understand what insulting a soldier might mean in practice, I think it's pretty vague. <laughs> uh, it's very open-ended, and it could justify uh, a lot of, uh, you know, any type of arrest, I think, in, in, in most situations. So that, that kind of gives you a sense of what the military law, what's included in the military law, at least when it comes to um, security offenses. And the main charge that kids, about 60% of the kids charged in the Israeli military courts are charged with throwing stones. Um, that's the typical charge. There are other charges, like being a member of a banned organization. It's also an offense under military law. Uh, organizing protests, being part of protests, that's an offense under military law. So you, you see how the, the more um, conflict-related, occupation-related offenses find their way into the criminal law through the military law. Since, since 2000, we estimate that uh, around 8,000 kids, Palestinian kids, have been arrested in the West Bank by the Israeli army and charged in the military courts. Um, we must estimate about 500 to 700 kids each year between the age of 12 and 17 are, are arrested and, and processed through the system. The, the military courts have jurisdiction over uh, any child above 12 years, old, 12 years old, any person above 12, really. Um, you, if you're a 12 year old, you can be charged in the military court, uh, which is a, a pretty a pretty drastic measure, right? Israel is the only country in the world that automatically and systematically charges kids in military courts. Um, you, you know, in the U.S., we've had Guantanamo, and we've held as a government uh, two, uh, at least two people that I know of that were below the age of 18. I'm not sure if we actually charge charge them, but that that in itself was an, an exceptional case. Um, kids generally are not prosecuted in military courts anywhere in the world, uh, and they definitely aren't systematically and automatically prosecuted in military courts anywhere in the world. So, I'll talk a little bit about the process of arrest and work through uh, the arrest, the transfer, and the interrogation phase. Um, from a child's perspective based on the documentation that, that we, we obtain. Um, so we have attorneys that work in both military courts. There's one in the north of the West Bank, Salem Military Court, and one near Ramallah, which is Offer Military Court. So we gather affidavits based on uh, the children that we represent before the military courts. Um, and we do prison visits to collect affidavits uh, from both children and eyewitnesses uh, and so any year we have between 150 to 250 cases that we document, and that's where all the information and all the statistics um, and data that I provide today, that's, that's the foundation and that's the basis for, for uh, everything that I'm talking about. Uh, just one note, the everything I'll talk about is, is related to the West Bank. Um, East Jerusalem, uh, following 1967, even though it's considered occupied territory uh, and part of the West Bank, Israel has always treated it as annexed land and applies Israeli civilian law there. So kids that are arrested, the Palestinian kids arrested in East Jerusalem are charged within the Israeli justice system, not in the military court system. So uh, everything is very specific to, to the West Bank that I'll be speaking about. Kids are arrested in Gaza, but since 2005, when Israel removed the settlements, um, the military presence is obviously different. It's a blockade. Uh, the soldiers are on the outside. Sometimes there's incursions. Um, sometimes kids are arrested from fishing boats and detained. Uh, but generally, everything I'm talking about is the West Bank. <coughs> so an arrest. About 50% of kids are arrested from their homes in the middle of the night. Okay, So anywhere 12 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m., um, soldiers come into the village come into the town, bang on the front door, maybe your mother goes down, maybe your father opens the door, maybe it's your older brother or your younger brother. Soldiers, if they don't storm in, they usually filter through the house. Some begin searching, others ask for IDs. Uh, if you're on your list, if you're not on their list, they see your ID, um, you'll be arrested, right? If you're arrested, you're generally taken out the front door your hands are tied behind your back with a single plastic cord, 
and then you have a blindfold placed over your face, over your eyes. You'll be, you know, in certain cases during the arrest, you'll fi you'll you'll suffer some form of physical violence, whether punching, slapping, uh, kicking, being hit with the stock of a rifle in some cases, being hit with a soldier's helmet in some cases. Um, as as Mira said in the introduction, based on our documentation. 74% of kids suffer some form of physical violence in the arrest, the transfer, or the interrogation phase. Um, there's also verbal abuse, uh, insults, threats that happen during an arrest, but also during the transfer process. So once you're, you're out of the house, you're bound, you're blindfolded, you're usually escorted, um, walked, maybe pushed, shoved uh, towards a military jeep, into a military jeep, where you're about 45% of cases, kids are, are made to sit on the metal floor. So you'll have the, you know, the back of a jeep, you have two benches on the side, and you have a metal floor in the middle. The soldiers will sit on the benches, and the kids are usually placed on the floor in the middle. Uh, and if you can you know, imagine that context, kids sitting there between uh, benches of soldiers, heavily armed, it's, it, they're vulnerable, right? You're bound, you're blindfolded, you're a child in this particular situation. So the military, so the detention system structurally consists of military camps, military bases throughout the West Bank, but also settlements, it's police stations and settlements. Um, and really what we see based on our documentation, that kids are arrested near areas where the occupation really has its teeth. So near military bases, near settlements, uh, if you're a child whose family has land that borders uh, the security zone around a settlement, that's a highly problematic area for you as a, a, as a young child, as a teenage boy, uh, a young kid, whatever it is. So well that, that's what we see. Kids that are arrested near these specific places where the occupation really has its roots. Um, they're also arrested near roads. Uh, that are used by Israeli settlers, Israeli army, they're arrested near checkpoints, through checkpoints, right? So think of anywhere where there's a soldier presence, anywhere where there's a settler presence, those are the communities that are most affected uh, from arrests. Once you're in a jeep, you're usually transferred to one of these military bases. If you're arrested at 2 a.m., you might arrive there at 3 a.m. When you arrive, They'll, the soldiers, the Israeli soldiers, will pull you out of the jeep. Maybe they'll leave you in the jeep. They could pull you out, put you on the ground, uh, put you inside a building, and usually you just sit there for hours. Uh, if you're lucky, the sun comes up, 9 a.m., 8 a.m., when a police interrogator arrives to the settlement nearby and begins his day, you'll be brought transferred to the, the police station where you end up in an interrogation room. Generally, the transfer period can take anywhere from a few hours, depending on when you're arrested. Um, it's up to 24 hours or even longer. It's kids do usually don't have access to food. They're usually not provided water. They generally are denied access to a toilet. Um, kids ask for those things and they get laughed at. You can imagine the, the different types of responses. Um, occasionally, uh, they'll be brought to a bathroom. They usually don't have their hands untied if they are. Uh, the blindfold is usually taken off and then replaced directly after that. About 88% of the cases, some point either either dur at when they're being transferred, sometimes they see uh, not necessarily a doctor, but somebody, somebody will ask them general questions, medical questions about their health, right? Um, really just a, a medical background from the child. During that, Kids are usually still have their hands tied. The blindfolds can be taken off, but they're generally hands tied. Um, whether it's during this transfer process or later on after they've uh, been transferred to a detention facility, about 88% of kids are completely strip searched. Um, some kids are strip searched multiple times. So when they first arrive in a military camp, they might have the, the questions about their health, and then they'll be strip searched uh, immediately before that or after that. So it's, uh, you know, it's humiliating. <laughs> Kids, no matter how old you are, I think 
if any of us were strip searched, we'd probably feel a bit humiliated uh, in, in that context. So once you arrive at a police station, you generally walk into an interrogation room with uh, a police, an Israeli police interrogator. And they tend to be, they have different styles, I'll say. Some tend to be more aggressive, uh, louder, bang on the table, they'll shout at you, uh, shout in your face, really try to intimidate you. And what we find, and based on the documentation, is that the interrogations are really built around obtaining confession. Um, if you can't obtain a confession as an interrogator, what we see based on the documentation is that you'll try to obtain some type of statement that in some way implicates the child in something, right? And it's important to remember that it's not, you know, for us as an organization, it's not about guilt or innocence, right? It's about respect for human rights, respect for international law, uh, and respect for human dignity. Um, what you have in the Israeli military court system is it's not a justice system, right? It's, it's a system set up to really implement an occupation. And when you look at the law and you look at the process of arrest, you find that it's not necessarily about guilt or innocence. Um, it's really a tool of an, an occupation that's maybe used to legitimize it, but it's, it's not about justice. So kids in that room, whether they throw in a stone or not, tend to confess. If they don't confess uh, and they deny the accusations, they could still end up with a statement that's drafted by the interrogator that some way connects them to something. Um, confessions are used as the main source of evidence for cases involving kids charged in military courts. Other pieces of evidence include statements from other children. So if I'm Brad, I'm 15, I'm from the tiny village called Azun. Uh, my friend was arrested two months ago. I'm a bit worried that the next time the Israeli army comes in at night, I'm going to be arrested because I know that my friend Ivan has been detained for the past two months. I know he's been interrogated. He might have gave my name. If he didn't give my name, <laughs> he might have, uh, it might have found its way into a statement. Um, and then that'll be used to arrest me. And then that will be used, so Ivan's statement will be used as evidence again against me to charge me in the military court. Um, whether I've confessed, whether I've thrown a stone, whether I've done anything. And that's, that's really the general uh, context that kids walk into an interrogation room with. The other piece of evidence that's usually present in that interrogation room, so if there's no child, if the interrogator doesn't have Yvonne's statement, he has a statement from a soldier. And this generally happens in most cases. There's a statement from the soldier who arrested them, the, the child, and that's the, the initial piece of evidence or the justification for issuing a warrant after the interrogation process. Soldiers sign statements, uh, statement goes into the file, and then that's part of the evidence used to charge in the military court. Right? More extreme interrogations can be violent. It can be, uh, you know, you might be punched, you might be slapped, you could be hit with, you know, a metal rod, some type of stick. Uh, really, you wouldn't be surprised by anything after reading the the hundreds of affidavits that we've collected. Um, I don't, you know, I'm rarely surprised uh, when I see the more extreme cases that really do rise to the level of torture. Um, but the general case, systematic ill treatment, is really shouting, uh, intimidating threats. Um, kids are often told that they'll they'll be released very soon mm -hmm. if they just confess. You know, we'll call your mom. If they can come pick you up, it it'll be over. Uh, that never happens, right? Kids rarely have access to counsel. They, I mean, 99% of the cases, kids don't have access to counsel uh, prior to an interrogation. Uh, it's the same number for kids that have access to counsel during interrogation. It just doesn't happen. It just doesn't exist. Uh, parents aren't hardly ever informed, if ever, um, that they're where their child's being taken. Uh, they're not notified the reason for an arrest. They're not notified where that child's going. Usually, uh, following an arrest, that child essentially disappears until they show up in a military court 
within 24 or 48 hours uh, after the arrest. And that period, that, that 24 or 48 hours after an arrest, is where the ill treatment happens, right? It's where the arrest happens. Uh, following the arrest, it's where the transfer occurs and where kids are vulnerable, they're bound and blindfolded, and then they, they show up in an interrogation room without having access to counsel, without even, you know, they haven't made a phone call to their parents, they're not able to make a phone call to their parents. There's not really, you know, there's no contact with the family. Um, DCI attorneys generally first see a child, and they're usually the first time, it's the first time a child has seen an attorney, is when they appear in a military court, either at Salem or Offer. If you're uh, 12 to 13, under a military law, you have to you have to appear before a military court judge within the first 24 hours after an arrest. Uh, if you're an Israeli child in the Israeli s justice system, that that period is 12 hours, right? So the international standard, the international law, is 24 hours, but you still have uh, disparity between Israeli law and Israeli military law that is applied to different populations strictly on a uh, person's identity. So if you're Israeli citizen, Israeli law. If you're a Palestinian, it's Israeli military law. If you're a 14 to 15 year old, you have to appear before a military court judge within 48 hours. Right? The same period, the same, uh, there's a corresponding time period for Israeli kids, Israeli citizens, um, is 24 hours. Right? So you still have that disparity. If you're a 16, 17 year old uh, Palestinian kid, under Israeli military law, you're treated as an adult. The, the time period before you have to arrive before a military court judge is 96 hours, and that's the same as adults under military law. Um, the time period for, for Israeli kids, the same, same age, is, is 24 hours. So those, that's, that's a huge <laughs> disparity in, in itself. Uh, but then you add in a denial of access to counsel, uh, a course of interrogations. I, I mean, we tend to think that uh, if, if you deny access to counsel for a child, anything that happens in that process, if they're not informed uh, properly of the right to silence, they don't have access to counsel, just the fact that that child's being interrogated, that's a course of interrogation, right? It, I mean, you're creating a situation that's manipulative. Um, you have a professional interrogator who's trained if I was in an interrogation room with, with, uh, with them, with any any interrogator, I mean the the power imbalance would feel pretty drastic to myself. And then you put a child in that room, and I think we can all imagine that you, you know the drastic difference in power in that situation is is huge. Um, and then you put into the uh, you add on top of that that the child's probably experienced some form of physical violence already. Um, it's probably not very difficult as a professional interrogator to, to really just coerce and manipulate that, that, that situation. So I talked about the evidence. Right? You have confessions. 16% uh, of the confessions in the cases that we document are drafted in Hebrew. Right? So kids don't speak Hebrew. Palestinian kids don't speak Hebrew generally. Uh, they don't know what those confessions include, they don't know what they say, they can't read them. Um, even if a statement or a confession is in Arabic, children usually don't have the, the ability or the time to read and understand what's in that statement. Uh, generally, the, you know, you'll have a table, the Yvonne is an er, uh, interrogator, you have the child sitting on the other side of the desk. Um, He's got his computer and a printer. He types up the statement as he's interrogating the child. He types up the confession as he's interrogating the child, prints it out, puts it down in front of the child, and says, sign it, essentially. If the kid doesn't sign it, he says, sign it a little bit stronger. Uh, use threats, intimidation. The kid signs it and then takes it back. There's really no opportunity for, for a child to read uh, what's included in that statement. And then these these confessions, these statements, form the basis for the military prosecutor to charge the child in the military court. Once you're in the court, I already talked about the timing, right? 24 hours, 48 hours, 96 hours, depending on your age. It's the first time you see your family. 
first time you've seen your seen an attorney and what happens in that first hearing is almost automatically the tension gets extended to the end of legal proceedings um, so you have just automatic pretrial detention for kids uh, when detention under I mean pretty much international humanitarian law and international human rights law the international consensus is that that is against the best interests of the child right you should have to the extent possible, explore any alternative means to detention. And that's not even a consideration within the Israeli military courts. And, and I should say that um, Israel has is, is signed the Convention on the Rights of the Child, right? the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, the UN Convention Against Torture, uh, the UN Convention on Civil and Political Rights, right? which all relate to justice systems, uh, protections for prisoners, um, protections against ill treatment, and Israel has obligated itself to prevent those abuses. Um, but it's not implemented in the West Bank, it's not implemented in the uh, Israeli military court system. So sentences, right? So you get into the court, you have your attorney, the attorney can't do much for you because you're going to automatically be detained until the end of legal proceedings. Um, in about 85% of cases, bail is denied. Uh, but even, uh, so <laughs> bail never comes up in that first hearing. You have to make a second hearing. Uh, you have to make a motion for bail after they've already been uh, decided that they'll stay in pretrial detention. Right? That, that happens in the first hearing. Kids are generally brought in so in 2009, the Israeli mil military courts, so the military law created a, a new juvenile military court. Um, and the idea was that if, if the international community, if Defense for Children International Palestine, if civil society is complaining about the protections in, in the military courts for kids, we'll create a juvenile military court specific for kids. Um, on paper and law, it looked great, um, but in practice, it didn't change anything. So you have military courts, now you have juvenile military courts, where if you're under 18, in theory, you go through a juvenile military court. But what that means is not much. The, they use the same infrastructure, the same court staff, uh, the same judges. The only thing in the military law that was somewhat differentiated the, the, the adult military courts versus the juvenile military courts is that judges have to have some type of special training. Um, and that's essentially what the military law says. It doesn't say what type of special training that they need to be trained on juvenile justice standards, that you know, maybe they have to do a course around uh, you know, international child rights law. Uh, it's really vague and we don't really see the difference. So if you're a DCI attorney working in offer or asylum, you'll see kids brought in with adults to the same courtroom. Um, the same judge will, will dispose of both cases on that day. Um, there's really no difference since that 2009 military order was issued. <coughs> Are there any questions? Oh, sorry. I was I'm, yeah. Um, what percentage of the children are girls? That's a good question. I should have mentioned this with the, the order. So the military court system, when it comes to detention, it's really all boys, almost 100% boys. So in the end of July, right, so numbers are an issue. We know that around 500 to 700 kids are arrested each year, and that's based on uh, the Israeli Prison Service provides numbers, um, but it's only a snapshot. So the end of July, we know on the last day that there were 195 kids uh, in detention, Israeli military detention. We don't know how many kids were in detention the day before or the day after. We only get that snapshot at the end of the month, um, and so we estimate that it's about 500 to 700 kids. So in the end of July, the last time we got the numbers, there were zero girls in detention. Um, previously, throughout the past seven, eight, nine months, there's been one girl who's been serving a sentence, and she was the only girl in detention. And so the cases of girls are tend to be you know, outside of the systematic uh, ill treatment uh, outside of the, the systematic process of arrest, right? That's specifically to boys. 
case of a girls, they're usually trying to, at least based on uh, the cases that we've uh, documented and that we know, uh, cases of girls tend to involve a girl trying to escape some terrible situation at home. Um, whether it's sexual violence, domestic violence, they know if they can walk through a checkpoint with a knife, they can get arrested, and they'll be removed from that situation. So y you have really terrible things happening when it comes to girls, but it's not on the systematic level that that affects boys. Um, so that's a good question. I forgot to mention that. Let's see. How, when, how long were we going to go? Okay. No, yeah, let me talk a little bit more about the, the military courts and then some of the things that we work on and um, some of the recommendations we have, and then we can, I think, leave the last 15 minutes for questions, okay? <coughs> so if you talk to a DCI attorney that works in the military courts and you ask them what their role is, what do they do? How can they help kids? Uh, they'll generally say that they don't practice, they don't feel like they practice law in the military courts. Right? They're set up in a system that isn't necessarily to achieve justice. Um, it really is about an occupation and control. So when you have confessions, generally coerced, uh, you have statements from other kids that tend to be coerced, <laughs> uh, and then you have statements from soldiers that implicate your client, your chi the child you're representing, um, in, in some type of criminal activity under the, the Israeli military law. It's really difficult to go into a court that's operated, operated by that same <laughs> occupying force and challenge those charges. Uh, you have military court judges. They're active duty or else reserve officers in the Israeli army. Um, and you know they're responsible for implementing military law as part of an occupation against a population that exists in that territory. So it's it, it's really difficult. Um, most kids plead guilty because it's the fastest way out of the system. Um, just to give you a sense of, you know, I've said the military courts aren't really about justice, but there's the military courts produce a annual report every year. I think in 2011, the the conviction rate included in the, own the Israeli military court's own report was 98% conviction rate. Um, <laughs> if, if, if a justice system convicts 98% of the people that's brought before it, there's probably some serious and fundamental flaws within that system. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's pretty insane. So that gives you a sense of you know everything that I'm talking about it's not a justice system. And to, to think about it like that is, is just not accurate. So kids plead guilty. Um, it's the fastest way out. If you, if you don't plead guilty, there's a bit of time you might spend within the Israeli military court system. So following an arrest, the Israeli army the military prosecutor has 188 days to charge you. Right? If you're an Israeli child, an Israeli citizen under Israeli law, you have to be charged within 40 days. If you're a Palestinian child under Israeli military law, you can be, you can be denied access to an attorney for up to 90 days under Israeli military law. Um, so. If, so that 188 days period where kids have to be charged or released, say you're, you're charged on the you know, five months and 20 days. From that day that you're charged, the Israeli military court system has one year to finish legal proceedings against you. If you're an Israeli child in the Israeli system, legal proceedings have to be finished within six months after you've been charged. So you see the, the disparity between those protections. So what happens when kids plead guilty? There's usually an agreement between the military prosecutor and the military judge, right? Plea agreement that comes up with a sentence, 
generally a fine as well, and then um, a certain probationary period, right, with a suspended sentence. So Yvonne throws stones, if he's 15, he'll probably, if it's one stone throwing charge, plea agreement most likely would be anywhere from five to seven months. He would probably have a thousand shekel fine, which, what's that in dollars? <laughs> So like three hundred and fifty dollars, um, but he also walk away with uh, a suspended sentence, probation essentially, where that could be anywhere from one year up to five years. Even if he's if saves fifteen, that five year probationary period taken past eighteen, um, that doesn't necessarily matter. So if he gets arrested, if it's stone throwing charge, if he gets arrested for throwing stones, um, at some point within that five years he gets the automatic sentence of whatever that, co that sentence was. So say it's six months. Um, he gets that suspended sentence, it kicks in, he goes back straight, uh, serves that time. So you, you don't just have you know, the initial four or three month pretrial detention that usually gets rolled into uh, a plea agreement and it all magically works out. If you're 15, you're gonna have pretrial detention for about five months, then everybody's gonna come together and the judge and military prosecutor will agree on a plea agreement that magically tends to be about five months and you get time served and then you get the fine and spend its sentence um, that's that's generally the process if you're 12 to 13 there's maximum sentence right so the, that 10 year 20 year potential stone throwing charge if you're 12 and 13 you, you're that's not applicable to you right you have a maximum sentence under military law of six months for 12 and 13 year olds if you're 14, 15, it's a maximum sentence of 12 months. But it comes with a huge exception. Under the military law, if you're charged, so if you're 14 and 15, and you're charged with a crime that has a maximum sentence above five years, say stone throwing, <laughs> uh, which 60% of the kids are charged with, um, that 12 month maximum sentence disappears. And you can be sentenced up to the, the full extent of the maximum for that particular charge. Does that make sense? So say Yvonne's arrested, charged with stone throwing, he's 15. If he's uh, a 15 year old that's charged with something else that has a one year maximum sentence, that's it, right? Say it has a three, ma three year maximum sentence, the most he can be sentenced to is 12 months. But if he's charged with stone throwing and he's 15, that 12 month maximum disappears and he could be charged and sentenced to something uh, above 12 months, okay? If you're 16, 17, there's no special protections, you're treated as an adult, that's, that's it. So even though in 2011, Israeli uh, military law included a provision that raised the age of majority from 16 to 18, it didn't change anything. Um, the only thing it affected was if you're 16, 17, and you're arrested, you'll be charged in the juvenile military court. That's essentially it. Uh, it didn't affect sentencing provisions, so 16 and 17 year olds are still subject to the same sentencing requirements as adults. Uh, it didn't affect the change in the time before you have to be brought toward to a military court judge. That's still the same as adults. Um, so you have serious issues still with recognition of special uh, protections for children, um, in addition to just the the, the huge disparity between uh, Israeli military law and uh, international hum humanitarian law, human rights standards. So I think that, that generally gives you a sense of the situation for kids that are charged in this particular military court system. Um, I, you know, I think we'll, we'll take a, bit, a few questions and I'd like to talk about other issues. Uh, we, we also document settler violence, soldier violence, um, you know, human shields. So if there's questions on that, in addition to detention, then we'd love to talk about that. Very much. Can you give us some uh, figures for the number of children uh, currently detained? Apparently, uh, the number of Palestinian prisoners held by the uh, uh, Israeli uh, military occupation has been dwindling it's now about 4,500, I think. What percentage, what are the numbers of the uh, children uh, 
out of that big number. So Dave, can you just respond to that? So, so we know at the end of July, um, there were 195 Palestinian kids under 18 held in Israeli detention facilities. I under know under, under, so 12 to 17 okay. years old, so kids, right, under international law. Uh, do you remember the August number? Yeah, the August number actually fell to 179. Yeah, and so what we've seen over, you know, the trends for, for the end of 2012 through 2013 is detentions were rising, arrests, and kids in military detention were, were increasing through December, January, February, March, April, and then they slowly started to decrease. And then uh, this is, I think, the, the largest decrease is from last month, from July to August. Um, it went from 170, 190, 195 to 179. But within that, you know, over the first few months of this year, um, even though detentions were increasing, the, s the significant trend was that the detention of tw kids ages 12 to 15 were increasing uh, you know, at a disproportionate rate to, to other detentions of kids. Mm -hmm. Um, so we had the highest number of kids, I think, detained. Uh, the highest number of, of kids, 12 to 15, were detained in March and April of this year. Uh, it was the highest number since, I think, March 2010. Um, so we'll see what happens through the rest of the year, but that was a significant uh, spike and a significant trend that we noticed within the detention figures. And is the figure of 45 Total. Is the figure of 4,500 total uh, accurate, mm -hmm. do you believe? It, it jumps between 4,500 to 5,000. Uh, so it, it drops uh, depending on the, the month that the numbers are actually uh, taken. So we've seen it rise up to 4,800 this year and then drop back to 4,500 uh, generally. And much like with the kids we, we saw in the earlier part of the year, there were about 240 kids uh, in detention, and then that number has dropped down to 179. Could you comment on the issue of repeat arrests, meaning uh, to what extent uh, children get arrested and go to prison and then never go there again, or are, they, are there many examples of uh, repeat uh, arrests? So it's based on the documentation we have, it's difficult. I mean, we do have cases that we document of kids that have been arrested um, twice, sometimes multiple times. But to, to get a sense of how often that happens throughout the West Bank, throughout the Israeli military detention system, is, is a bit difficult. There's not really a tracking system or, um, you know, we may have a child that's been arrested and he was arrested previously and that usually comes up in the, the questionnaire that we have in the affidavit, pro affidavit process that we, we, we use, um, but sometimes it might not. <laughs> and sometimes uh, other organizations that work on the issue too, just they don't have a sense of it. Um, but it does happen, we do have cases, uh, several cases that we, I know. We actually wrote about this one kid who was first arrested when he was 13 and spent about four months uh, in jail. And then he was released and rearrested again for stone throwing at the age of 14 and spent a further five months in jail. And what's, what's interesting, when, when kids actually spend that amount of time in jail, the Palestinian Authority, uh, the, Ministry of the Palestinian Ministry of Education requires that any child that misses more than 60 days of school has to repeat the year. Um, and most kids uh, don't want to repeat the year, don't want to be held back. And, and in the case of this child, for example, he was held back when he was 13 and he was held back again when he was 14. So these arrests totaling, uh, so his time spent behind uh, bars totaling about eight months uh, have altered his life because he's dropped out of school and has no interest in continuing his education. And so the, the, the problems just continue for that child after the, he's been released from jail. Uh, and then it's also known that once you are in the system, um, it's difficult to completely get out. So if there's a raid in the town and, and the Israeli army has heard that there have been children throwing stones at the highway, uh, th they'll first go to the same, they'll round up the same children that they've rounded up in the first place. And then we've had several cases where um, there were kids throwing s stones at, at a highway um, and then the Israeli army just did a widespread arrest and arrested about like 12 kids 
uh, only to find out that seven of them weren't even near the area, but a lot of these kids were released after spending three or four days in solitary confinement and after having gone through the abuse and then, and then they realized, oh, they weren't even in the vicinity, so sorry, and they just let them out. Um, so, so there are repeat arrests, yeah. Oh, hi, I'm uh, Phil Schraver, happen to be a, a neighbor. <laughs> and I have, Mr. Parker, I have a question, uh, just, well, two quick questions. One question is, are, is your organization subject to any harassment, like power switched to off offices, investigated, uh, people stopped at checkpoint? And then the last question, are most of these kids in school or, or not? Harassment? I mean, I think, you know, we're based in Ramallah. We have an office in Hebron, Annapolis, so, uh, I mean, movement, you have checkpoints, you have everything that you know about that comes with the occupation. So staff, I think, has the, the issues that Palestinians face. I mean, they face it in their work. Um, so, but we, you know, uh, there's another prisoner's rights organization in Ramallah called Adamir, um, and they, they have, you know, they mainly have the problems with raids and uh, they have staff arrested. Luckily, we, we don't. Um, you know, part of that might be we work specifically with kids. Uh, and sorry, what's the second oh, part? Education, are they, are they in school? Generally, yeah, <coughs> most of the kids are. Some of the older kids, we do have cases where it's a 17 year old and he works full time. Um, you know, but generally, most of the cases we have kids are in school and, and typical kids. <laughs> Hi, I'm Josh Huff with Christian Peacemaker Teams working in, in and outside of El Khalil. Uh, wondering if uh, in Area C, my interest, uh, your capacity and your access to collect data and to collect reports is reduced, and whether or not that's true, is there reason to suspect that uh, this condition overall or certain aspects of this condition are particularly worse in Area C, and if so, why? Yeah, I think they're definitely, you know, you don't have kids being arrested from Ramallah. Uh, kids are arrested in, in areas where there's settlers, there's settler roads, or where they interact uh, with that infrastructure and with those 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 people. Um, so, you know, for certain violations, I think our ability to document cases in, in certain areas is probably a, is a bit challenging. But when it comes to the military court system, uh, I mean, the Israelis army essentially <laughs> helps with our documentation in a sense because they arrest the kids and they bring them to the military courts where we have our DCI Palestine attorneys that then represent them, uh, take affidavits. So you do get a sense of how particular communities, even in Area C or even in, in places that are challenging to, to do human rights documentation, um, you get a sense of the specific issues that kids face because, I mean, it's just part of the detention process. They're detained, brought to a place outside of uh, their own villages, their own neighborhoods, and, and it helps us get a sense of that. Well, well, first of all, thank you very much for the very informative uh, presentation. Uh, truly appreciate it. I have two, two main um, um, comments, you know, maybe uh, questions, quick ones. Uh, the first one on the conviction rate. You mentioned 98%. And uh, do you have any comparative data with other countries, not necessarily within the military you know, system because we don't have many countries under occupation? But if you have anything, you know, to compare with would be very uh, helpful. Uh, and my other question is about how the BA is actually dealing with this issue. You mentioned that if you miss 60 days in school, you have to repeat that, that school year. My question is, is there anything the BA could do, and do you have any recommendations uh, for the BA in order for them to uh, deal with that um, uh, phenomena or that, that problem? And the other issue is also, you mentioned that you're not uh, monitoring what happens in the Israeli civil uh, court system. Um, um, what happens, for example, to a kid that is um, arrested or detained in, 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 in Jerusalem? without having uh, Israeli ID uh, number, you know, that would, are they transferred to the military system or are they tried uh, in the Israeli military system? And do you track any, any data also on that system or not? Yeah. Thank you. So, so first, conviction rates, um, you know, it is exceptional. That's, that's the, the main thing is that there really isn't a comparison uh, because there really isn't a military court system that operates the way the Israeli military court system does under military law. Um, but, you know, 
without having something on the top of my head. I know from doing uh, some different access to justice work, both you know around the world in Latin America and Haiti, that conviction rates over 60, 70 percent. I mean, if you are anywhere near 80, uh, seriously problematic. Um, so if you're at 98 percent, that's uh, I mean, it's, it, it's essentially off the charts for anything that you could ever find to compare it to. Um, and maybe Yvonne can talk about the PA challenges a bit and uh, recommendations. Sure. Um, so we're actually in a good position with the PA because we could actually reach them and, and discuss different things they could do to help children. And we usually get, once we raise certain uh, issues with them, we usually get a positive response and can work with them. Um, the PA also does provide, uh, you know, through the Prisoner Affairs Ministry, does provide services to, to children. They, they also do represent children in the legal uh, system. Um, a lot of what we're trying though to do, uh, for example, in schools, is, is build up the capacity of, of the social worker or the counselor at the school to provide the child with the necessary support after being released from prison to be able to cope with getting back into norm, you know, as normal for life as, as possible. And, and that's still something in progress. It's not, you know, there's a lot of schools where Unfortunately, the child doesn't get receive the, the necessary care um, to just be able to adapt and continue. Um, there are also a couple of uh, centers that we work with in, in the Palestinian territories, including the Palestinian Counseling Center and the YMCA Rehabilitation uh, Center. And they also go and try and provide children with the necessary tools to be able to continue with their lives as opposed to having them interrupted on a more permanent basis. And we work, we refer a lot of cases to them where we feel the child needs the additional support to get, to get through. Uh, and so in some cases, if it, sorry, in some cases, if a child does manage to pass the end of year exams and does manage to get back on track academically, then the, past, the Ministry of Education doesn't hold that child back. But a lot of times we just find the children have no interest whatsoever in studying or getting back into the cycle of, of their life. Yep. And for the, the East Jerusalem question, so I focused on the West Bank, but so we have a, a lawyer that works in, in East Jerusalem representing Palestinian kids that are arrested by the army, by the police. Um, and in that, I, I mean, the figures are very similar. So it's about 75% uh, kids within East Jerusalem that are arrested by the Israeli military or police also ex experience some form of, civil, of, of uh, physical violence. So you have really statistically for the ill treatment, very similar context and the arrests are, are similar but because you have enhanced protections and the Palestinian kids, even though they're in East Jerusalem, they're, they're subject to Israeli law that has uh, the different protect protections that I mentioned. So the, the opportunity for ill treatment, right? In the West Bank, it's really that first 24, 48 hours before you see a military court judge. Um, that's, that's cut in half right, if you're from East Jerusalem. Um, so the opportunity for ill treatment is, is different, but it still exists. So, sorry. So what if you are arrested in Israel? Are you transferred to the Israeli system? No, no. You'll be you'll be prosecuted in the Israeli system. And then the, just interestingly enough, also about the Jerusalem side is the, we we do represent kids there, but also there are a lot of organizations within uh, Israel that are uh, happy to assist these kids. Whereas in the West Bank, there's is really we're the only child's rights organization with child's rights legal experience uh, and then there are just a few other groups that also do that work so there's a lot more pressure on the West Bank than there is in, in the Jerusalem system. We actually need to conclude this but you're welcome to stay in, and talk further with our guests and ask more questions but we're actually going to conclude the uh, recording and the live stream so thank you very much let's give them a